make the sedimentary unit fairly easy, accurate, it, make it relatively easy to correlate. Um, the stratigraphic layer, of course, suggests a marine, a marine transgression of relatively recent time that resulted in a clear, shallow water Gulf Sea lapping at the margin of ancient Sumerian cities. The price, precise extent of duration, the price, the precise extent and duration of the inundation, however, remains unclear. But successive sedimentation showed that gradual silting up of the inland sea as shelly marls were replaced by silting clay became embedded with an increasingly restricted marine fauna. Eventually, the marine sediments were completely overlain by fluviatile, lacustrine, and estuarine sediments with freshwater flora and fauna approaching a more modern geography. So taking into these, these factors into account and recognizing that we still um, lack a lot of information on the precise timing and extent of these phenomena, uh, the late Andrew Sherratt offered a, a rather elegant model of deltaic evolution in Mesopotamia. Initially, in the first phase of his model, active in the early Bronze Age, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers effectively coalesced near to Baghdad and formed a complex of braided channels along the axis of a deltaic lobe. The separation of the Tigris and Euphrates courses and the formation of, separate, of a separate Tigris lobe is a process which may have begun in the third millennium and continued through following millennia with rapid progradation and infilling the shallow upper waters of the Gulf. The continuation of this process, together with the extension of the Karun Delta, was responsible for the formation of the present landscape that we know today. So at an early stage in their development, the river's flute would have flown axially along a single delta lobe. As sediment accumulated, the river system split into two along the slopes of their fan. And finally, the river courses had flown along the edge of a newly developing interfluve. And so this is a, um, a nice model that Sherrod had presented, basically a superimposition of these phases representing uh, the outward displacement of the river courses. So the development of the Southern Mesopotamian Plain and the patterns of settlement within it over a very long period um, might be supported by this model. It's something that um, I think a lot of people right now are looking to, to find out. And if his model is correct, even generally, it means that during at least the Uruk period and continuing for a yet undetermined amount of time later, Sumer is separated from its westerly neighbors, I'm sorry, its easterly neighbors rather, by a large body of water constituting the shallow upper reaches of a marine embayment. The fundamental point of this model just reviewed is that the delta as you see it today um, in Iraq, that's the Shat al-Arab, is not the Mesopotamian delta of Mesopotamia, or rather Sumer. In fact, the Shat al-Arab delta is a tidally influenced delta, a unique type of delta with a unique type of delta, deltaic architecture, progradation regime, and thus landscape surface. The following discussion will suggest that the type of delta active, at least in the Lagash region during the Middle Holocene, was remarkably different, approaching more of a flu fluvially dom dominated delta front with its distributaries into the marine embayment. So to know what topography was offered to the early settlers of the Mesopotamian landscape, as well as its first urban inhabitants, we need to define the Bronze Age Delta type and model its implications for settlement histories across the valley. So to discuss this point, we're gonna focus on a site, on the site in the immediate floodplain of Lagash uh, near the modern cities, modern cities of Shachin and Juwaya. So um, of course I'm using one of these readily available Google Maps or a version of it um, that um, I'm kind of saying is, is something that we eventually will be able to stop doing and have something that approaches a bit more of a reality. Um, but this is to just situate everybody in space here. So here's Lagash. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the city state of Lagash. Um, and in terms of where it is in the broader scheme of Iraq, you see it on the inset map or the dinger sign here on the logo. Um, so partly um, the reason we're focusing on this region is because we're part of a team that has initiated a new multi-pronged research program at the ancient city, uh, a part of which is paleo-environmental reconstruction. But the more fortuitous purpose, at least for us, is that it will allow us to study and reconstruct the geomorphodynamics of the eastern alluvium, a part of Mesopotamia that has escaped studies focused more to the very west and northwest sites, for instance, like Uruk that we had just heard about. So today, uh, this area is dominated by the Shat al-Garaf, a branch of the Tigris, 
um, that comes down from all high. But as you can see in these diagrams, the Tigris and Euphrates today form separate lacustrine, they're intercontinental deltas, uh, which is fairly unusual in itself, of greatly diminished strength, partly because of upstream damming, um, uh, as well as um, evapotranspiration, irrigation, and the general absorption of the waters into the various marshes and wetlands. Um, but even so, the architecture of these two deltas are very, very distinct. And you can see um, in terms of uh, anastomosis and distributary channels, um, the Tigris and the, and the Euphrates present a very different topography. So areas especially vulnerable to river revulsion here uh, tend to be at the head of the plains, such as in the region of Sippar, uh, where there is a really abrupt change in uh, ground gradient. And then areas near the head of the Gulf, uh, where rising seas uh, decreased, at least in antiquity, river channel slopes to really promote and encourage channel aggradation and um, even to help them to surpass avulsion thresholds. So this is a schematic figure uh, from Tony Wilkinson's um, sort of Landscapes of the Near East book. Um, and what he's trying to show here, uh, and he's matching his data with some of the geomorphological work that had been done by the Belgians a bit farther north, um, that you know there are two main sequences in, with respect to the fluvial geomorphology. There's sort of a, an Ubeid Uruk morphology and then uh, there's a really abrupt switch, switch um, right before the early dynastic period. Uh, and then that early dynastic morphology kind of continues up until the Sasanian period when things really start to change. Um, but ultimately in the Uruk, the Ubeid Uruk period, you're dealing with a much lower energy environment. Um, this is not surprising, you know, given all the late, the, a lot of the recent theoretical underpinnings of sort of uh, wetlands and their relationship to Ube and Uruk societies. Um, but what is interesting is that we find this uh, both, again, up in Sippar where the Belgians are working or at uh, Talbohaba and then farther in Nippur. And then if we're going to move a bit farther south here, this is coming from, um, you know, data collected during Adams's magisterial surveys where he traced a river course um, uh, to um, the north uh, and northeast of Adam. And basically, um, he theorized based on channel sinu sinuosity that this course, which was active primarily in the Uved through uh, late Uruk period, it lasted a little into the Jimnet Nasser, but died out thereafter, basically emptied into a very large standing body of water um, and he would even go on to possibly to suggest that that possibly would have been uh, a, a marine embayment. And here's a, just a quick slide of Adab. And uh, for the purposes of this, this talk, Adab's relationship to um, the city state of Lagash. So, one of the wonderful parts of this conference is having our colleagues in GeoServe uh, present and in conversation with us. They've been really making available a lot of data recently uh, from great work that was happening in the late 1970s um, that was unable to be published throughout the war years. And they're making that, 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 that information public. So what we have here is a very large cross section of the Mesopotamian plain. Um, and this is actually critical for a few reasons. Uh, the first part of this I wanna point out, so, this area of uh, the plain that I'm talking about, or that Adams had pointed out, may have contained a marine embayment, is trending east toward uh, the Amara region. And so that Hamar, Hamar formation that we discussed earlier, um, part of the 1979-1980 GeoServe drilling work, um, they were able to peg this um, in this vicinity. Um, and then a few other things I'm going to point out as we go through this. So Akrawi, who many of you may be familiar with, and that served, his data served as the basis for a lot of Jenny Pornell's work, his boring locations um, and some additional sedimentological data that he didn't then did not have access to actually come out in this. And we're actually able to correlate that work through uh, 
a key that had, has recently been published um, by the Iraqis. But what I briefly wanted to show you with this slide um, is this um, Hamar uh, layer here. And so this figure, um, which I had shown you, oops, sorry, uh, earlier coming from a Crowley's work, um, presents an isometric view of Mesopotamian plains. So A is Amara, C is Nasiriya, B, uh, incredibly, is just six kilometers from the site of Lagash. Uh, these are relatively deep bores uh, conducted under um, pretty um, overall good circumstances in, in terms of the getting good control on the sedimentological data. So here's the site of Lagash, here is Borehole B, which again was taken in 1979-1980. So Crowley uh, got very good data for Borehole C, which was taken uh, not far from the site of Ore, um, collected just outside of Nasiriya. Um, and in this, he was able to date a transgression level to uh, the sixth millennium BP. So Borehole B, um, you know, unfortunately, he wasn't able to, he didn't publish the log. Um, I'm not sure of the circumstances behind that, but he did conduct uh, some chemostratigraphy and radiometric analysis on that log. And what he was able to show was, um, first and foremost, this was a particularly organic rich, or there were organic rich layers in this sediment hole. Um, and so um, upwards of 12 meters in depth representing a transitional zone between an older fluvial unit and a brackish marine unit, um, which he pegs as an ancient mark or lake. So the borehole's geochemistry indicated, a pre, and this was pre-transgressional, so a pre-transgressional lacustrine marsh sedimentology. And um, of course, what you can interpret that as is that Lagash, um, from a sort of floodplain flood perspective, was dominated by wetlands from roughly 9,000 years BP until it was then overlain by a transgression, uh, which he then dates from this stained borehole at some time in the sixth or fifth millennium. Um, I just also want to briefly note that um, the resulting dates of the organic rich samples um, that came from this um, kind of show two different important points. Uh, one, which you might expect, is that um, the dates are older with depth. Um, that's not always the case in a highly fluvially re reworked environment like this. Um, but just to kind of give you a little more confidence in his data, but also within the same borehole, the age differences uh, were quite visible even within sub-meter ranges. Um, so then there's two other important points to be made here by his study. So the first relates to subsidence more generally, which is a topic of conversation. Obviously, Dr. Bada brought this up earlier, and this was uh, has been a real source of contention um, first really introduced by Lees and Falcon and uh, part of the conversation that continues until today. Well. Um, he found uh, through uh, analyzing compaction rates that set, uh, subsidence in this part of the plain, um, not in the Lagash territory, but from Nasiriya and then farther uh, south um, coming into D and E, uh, subsidence had not really been a factor. Um, uh, but also um, that the organics that he was dating, and this is true across um, all of the boreholes, is that they indicated, um, so he's, he's dating basically peat-like substances. So in this environment, you don't have true peat, um, but you have highly carbaceous samples um, that formed under very specific con uh, conditions that were deficient in oxygen and then quickly covered by other sediment. So um, he basically goes on to um, discuss that the peat-like sedimentation uh, really took place across the plain uh, just prior to the Holocene marine transgression. Um, and that all of these sort of peat-like surfaces are situated just below that brackish marine unit. Uh, why this is important, I'm gonna tell you for the work that we did at Lagash coming up. Um, so, uh, and I and the, and the and just to talk to his subsidence point, so these triangles um, or this one triangle is a peat 
uh, from FAO that falls right along the general sea level curve. Um, and then a Crowley's radiometric samples are these diamonds uh, that also generally fall within the curve, um, showing that at least in this region or this part of the plane subsidence was uh, not as much of a factor as has previously been supposed. All right, so how does this relate to our work at Lagash? Uh, so in 2019, we set out on a geoarchaeological program there. Um, this first season, we were using a hand auger, uh, achieving um, basically at most depths of 12 meters. Um, here is a uh, digital elevation model. Here's the site of Lagash. Here are the auger, uh, some of the auger locations that we placed in this first season. Okay, and these are our results. So here's a, basically a plan. Um, this is uh, our profile. So I'm gonna bring just for those I'm familiar with the geography here, here's the site. And I want to bring your attention in particular to this uh, borehole Lagash 6. So what is really interesting here um, is that we collected uh, one of these peat carbaceous samples that again are rare and in, uh, few and in between here. Um, and of course, we got a really solid date for that. Um, that agrees really well with Akrawi's work, both what he has in Nasiriya and what he got just outside of the site of Lagash. Um, and then we have um, a clear uh, sort of marine fauna um, after that to sort of reconfirm what Crowley um, is suggesting here about uh, the deposition of peat-like materials uh, prior to and during um, the transgression. Uh, and importantly, then we have a real good sense of this uh, in the immediate vicinity of Lagash. And then if you see where we fall on the world sea level rise curve, um, where he is showing subsidence not being a factor in other areas of the plain, we can also say that, at least from this sample, it certainly seems to be the case that it's also not a major factor here near Lagash. So I say this, um, this uh, is um, sort of a reconstructed map of some fairly recently released radiocarbon dates um, based on shell. Uh, so obviously the dates are later than the peats because these are actual Hamar dates. Um, but I do this to kind of show that these dates uh, fall in line with the other uh, much earlier released dates and some other dates that we're getting out at Lagash um, that, you know, the, the sort of the timing uh, is really no longer a question that the if and when um, it's now getting to um, the sort of spatial, the precise spatial parameters and, 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 and when it receded. And so now I just kind of want to briefly talk about this in terms of Lagash um, as a city state, what we know historically. So Caraway has some really great discussions on uh, different settlement types in the area uh, from marsh settlements to um, steppe settlements to, to, to river settlements um, and how through time there is a clear transition from, uh, or there's a clear decrease in marsh settlements and even a focus on marsh cult, particularly the Nancha cult at um, Ningen, uh, to eventually uh, the movement of political power up in Girsu. Um, and what is interesting is, you know, if you look at, um, so Jakobsen completed a survey uh, in this area in 1969, uh, and he found a number of early dynastic sites, very, very different from what um, you know, Adams found in uh, uh, in his surveys in the Uruk area in the in the central area, um, and um, if you look at this map, this was provided to me by Jenny. This came from Kafka Consulting Engineers. It was a really highly de detailed topographic survey in the Lagash, uh, sort of the Garaf irrigation zone in the 1950s where, you know, if you remember this slide earlier, where there's um, very slow grade down, once you get this far, there's not a lot of change in topography, everything's relatively flat. There actually is a really low dip uh, here in this area. 
um, which on Jakobsen's map is called the Shat el Qadr, which is actually not the Shat el Qadr. It's uh, the um, the Shat uh, uh, the Shat al. Uh, it's it's the the translation is Green River, um, basically. And, uh, so I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Um, and it's sort of like legendary with the people that live there, how, um, you know, for the longest time, um, this was like a very rich agricultural region. The waters ran green, which is how uh, it got its name, um, but that it was eventually drained um, due to, uh, I think, in, in World War I. But in terms of settlements out here today, it's only Islamic. There is absolutely nothing um, that dates uh, the Islam or predates the Islamic period. And so, um, and if you look at the, the topographic maps, I mean, so, you, and you're coming up farther north than here, uh, here's Adab, uh, Adams is, you know, had proposed uh, entrance to an embayment is up here. I mean, it makes perfect sense that this would have been an embayment uh, in antiquity. And um, the question is, you know, exactly how long did it last for? Um, and uh, that's something that we're gonna have to target um, in future seasons. But uh, just in conclusion, you know, I wanna point out um, so that our work is basically reinforcing the Crowley's radiometric data, which is important because there's actually a lot there. Um, and it's good to know um, that it is, um, applicable today. Um, we seemingly hit a pre-Hamar formation surface, uh, which is which is really helpful. Um, and that's coming right before uh, some clear Hamar fauna. We have good dates for that. And because our data are fitting generally on the C curve, uh, we're also in increasing agreement with a number of scholars, not just a Crowley, that, that subsidence in this part of the plane is not um, much of a factor. Um, and then there's uh, just general topographical considerations that do strengthen this idea of a uh, sort of leg of the Gulf um, that is sort of forming an upper sea in the lower sea in this area. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd just like to thank you for your attention and thank you again for uh, giving us the opportunity to present our results.